So, what we did so far, we looked at the noise properties of individual devices. Now the question is, what happens in the circuit context? How do we evaluate the noise of a circuit? In general, what you have is that a lot of time, what you have is that you have a box, right? So you think about it as a circuit with multiple ports, let's say two ports, two ports, and inside you have <coughs> noise sources galore, right? And you have different noise sources, currents and voltage sources here and there and there and there. So what do we do in something like this? Well, we really, the way we, where do we see the noise? These noise sources exhibit themselves through some transfer function, each one of them, from each one of them you have a transfer function to the output. Let's say this is your output, right? So each one of them <coughs> shows itself, shows some noise at the output, if it's connected to it, which is determined by the transfer function. And these different ones have different noise, so they have a transfer function. Now in general, if these sources are, could be generally, Partially correlated, so that could be a correlated part and uncorrelated part. So, how do we evaluate the total noise of the app? What we do is that we look at a use superposition. We say, okay, let's think about, and let's know all the other noise sources, namely if it's a multi source shorted, if it's a current source open ended, and see what one noise source causes at the app. What's the power that the generates at the app? And now let's add these terms the uncorrelated parts in power and the correlated parts in amplitude. <coughs> and get the total noise power at the output. And I'll show you some examples where it, how you, you will see how it works. But basically that's what you do. You say, I know all the, all the other ones, I take the effect of one into account at the output, and then I add all these effects in accordance with their correlation. If they're uncorrelated, a lot of times most of these noise sources are correlated because they're caused by different physical sources. So most of them just want to react with the total output power and add them up. But you will see cases where there's some correlation or correlation of part of the So let me show you an example. The easiest thing we can do is just think of an example. So let's start with a basic common source. V in, V out. We've analyzed this 100 times based on like that there for regular signals. Now let's look at it from a noise perspective. So what noise sources are there? Let's think about them. And I would put the noise sources, noise sources are really intrinsically intri a, a, something that you see in the small signal models. <coughs> and small signal models are very good for noise sources because the noise is, noise is very small, typically, right? So using the small signal model for noise, nobody complains about that if you start doing that. So what are the noise sources? Let's see, let's say we have a MOSFET. Let's think about the channel noise of the MOSFET. So we have I channel square over delta F, which was 4 K T gamma G V0 of this transistor. This resistor has a noise source, right? Where should I put it? I can use a voltage source in series or a current source in parallel. So for this analysis, it's easier to use a current source in parallel. So and it's a thermal noise. So I R squared over delta F, which is 4 K T over R. Right. And let's take the flicker noise of this guy. So you have V F squared over delta F, which is K F <coughs> over C ox W L 1 over F. So let's take three, these three noise sources. And then we say we are driving into the voltage source V in. What it means is that when you know all the other sources, you of course know the independent source as well. And knowing the independent source in this case means that you do what? You short circuit it to ground. So what you do, you really know the independent source, and then you evaluate the effect of each one of them at the output. Let's see what their effects are. So let's start with the flip. What is the flip if you have a voltage here, what is the what is the voltage gain from here to there? This this really acts like the source, like we get when this is short. There's no differential. <coughs> so the gain, the voltage gain from here to there is G minus GMRD, right? So GMRD. So when this is the voltage squared, so to get the current to, to get the voltage squared at the output, you get GM squared RD squared. So at the output, you have the first term of the output due to this guy is going to be um, G 
gm squared, rd squared, times kf over c ox, w over l, 1 over l. Now, what else? Then you have the channels. It's a current source driving out. <coughs> so what is the voltage at the output? If the current source and everything else is null, so this is shorted, this is open. Is this current source going into what? RD. RD, if you ignore RO, which we have in this case. If you add the RO, it would be RD parallel RO. So it would be this I channel, so let me write this two different ways. GM squared RD squared VF squared over delta F plus, so this one would be RD squared times I channel squared over delta F, which is RD squared um, for KT gamma, GD0. And then how, how about the noise of the resistor itself? Is this current again driving, this current is driving the, this node? What is the impedance of this node to ground? From this node to ground is RD again, it's the same node. So it's again plus RD squared times I R squared over delta F. So it becomes Rd squared times 4kT over Rd, which basically becomes 4kT Rd. Which should be that surprising, because if you look at the feminine equivalent of this thing, it would be the voltage source, which is 4kT Rd, driving out. So this is the total power spectrum of the output. And in, in, make, in writing this sum the way I did, I've made an assumption, which is a correct assumption, about the correlation of these sources. I've added all of them in power, which means that I assume that they are uncorrelated. And they are, because they're caused by three different physical mechanisms. Right? This one is caused by the fluctuation of the electrons in the, in the, the thermal fluctuations of the electrons in this resistor. These are caused by thermal fluctuations of the electrons in the channel of this MOSFET. And this one is caused by the thermal fluctuation, uh, not thermal, we said that the flicker noise of this device at the interface. The trapping, the, the random times that are associated with the trapping and releasing of the electrons in the channel. So this is the total noise at the output. This is a, phys a real physical quantity. So if you actually go and put a very sensitive spectrum analyzer or oscilloscope and look at this, you see a random waveform that has this power. So you can actually physically measure this. You can go there, if you make a stage, put a sensitive sensor there, you will see this noise power. Okay. However, you have to really, whether or not this is good or bad, is a function of what? Why do we care about noise to begin with? What is the reason that we have analyzed noise? We talked about this briefly in the beginning. The reason is that noise determines what is the smallest signal that you can detect, right? You remember the dynamic range, and we're talking about the dynamic range. What is the max, the, the ratio of the largest signal to the smallest signal that we can detect? We want this to be as large, or we can process. We want this to be as large as possible. The high end of the dynamic range, the top end, is determined by the nonlinearities. When the devices become nonlinear, when they basically saturate, the voltage limits are hit, you're clipping, clamping, things of like that sort, right? Now, on the bottom end, you're determined, the smallest signals are determined by the noise. Because that's when, when the signal, signal becomes much smaller than your noise, then it's not distinguishable from the noise, and it becomes harder to get it out if, not, if, if possible at all. There are tricks to do that, but we can talk about it later. So I want to compare it to the signal. So that if my V in was here, right, I would want to see what I would see at the output. So at the output, V out, at the output was G M R D V in. So if I wanted to look at the V out square, magnitude square, or something like that, then I had to take this square and this square. And I had to compare this voltage with this voltage, integrated over the band, this voltage power spectrum test, right? So I had to compare, but this is a kind of difficult comparison because I'm compared, I have to take <coughs> this input and say, well, okay, what kind of gain do I see from this input to the output? What kind of signal do I see at the output due to this signal? And what kind of noise do I see at the output due to all my noise sources? And what is the ratio? What is my signal to noise ratio? What's the ratio of the signal to this noise? And that would be a measure of how.
how good or how bad an amplifier is. So there's a, another way of treating this, which is a little bit simpler. Say, look, I think about this two port, if this is the input and this is the output. They say, yes, all of these noise sources individually cause something, they have some contribution to the output. This is what we calculated. But if I take this output and reflect it to the input, namely divide this output by the transfer function the, from this input to the output, magnitude squared, four is the power, right? That would give me a source at the input, an equivalent source, which I could say, for instance, if I had a voltage source, like that, which I could say, I can lump the effect of all of these into this source. In other words, the question I'm asking is this, you have to listen to this carefully. What is the source, what is the input source that would give me the same power at the output as the collective effect of all of these sources? And then I can compare that source directly with my input source. That's called the input refer choice. I refer the total noise of the system to the input. Basically, what I'm doing, the procedure is this. I calculate what is the effect of all these noise sources at the output. And I say to have that effect at the output, what do I have to have at the input to give me that effect in the absence of all these other sources? And that's called the input refer noise. And that's a lot of times what we calculate. Now, an important point that's often overlooked is that if I take a meter and I, like a oscilloscope or a spectrum analyzer, I put it at the output, I do measure that noise. This noise is real, it's there. However, if I take it and put it at the input, I don't see this. You can't measure the input referred noise at the input. It's not that it's, this noise is there. This is something to represent it and lump the effect of all of these other sources into one place. Say, well, what if, if I wanted to lump it in one source, what would that source be? It's a fictitious quantity. You make for convenience. Unlike the output noise, which is a real thing you can measure. So don't be confused. The input referred noise cannot be directly measured from this. The output can. So what, let's get at the input referred noise here. So what do I need to do if this is my output noise power? What is the input referred noise? Divided by what? GMRD squared. GMRD squared. GM squared, RD squared. Yeah, exactly. So in, in essence, if I'm ignoring the frequency dependence of this. In general, if I had a transfer function, my gain would have to be divided by, this output noise has to be divided by h of j omega magnitude squared. But since I'm only thinking about low frequency in this case in GMRD, so it, I just divide it by GMRD. So when I divide it by GMRD, so V in squared over delta f, the input referred noise would be, well, this divided by GMRD gives me simply what? Vx squared over delta f. So it seems that I've taken a very long and circuitous path from the input to the output back to the input. If I wanted to gather my input referred noise, I could easily see it is already here. This guy is already at the input. So it shouldn't be surprising that this part appears there verbatim. Right? Because it was already in the model at the input to begin with. How about the other sources? Well, this guy, the channel noise, gets divided by gm squared over d squared, so you get 1 over gm squared by channel squared over delta f. Plus, this guy, the same thing, so you can write it like this, 1 over gm squared <coughs> plus i r squared over delta f. Now if I expand them, I get kf cox wl f plus now, 1 over gm of this guy, so it gave me gd0 over gm squared times 4kt gamma plus, um, this is 4kt rd, so it gets 4kt over gm squared rd. Input of I know my input preferred voltage noise and I need to 
compare, this is a measure of what is the, if I want to see what signals I can detect, this would give me a measure of what to compare it to. What is the smallest signals I can detect? Right? So if I, and I would like to really reduce this. So let's say you want to reduce this. What would you do to your stage? Well, if you, by the way, one more thing to note here is that if you, are, if you have a long channel device, a non velocity saturated device, this becomes one with GM. Right? Because GD0 is GM for a long channel device. So, what does it tell you? It tells you your noise, your input preferred noise. Let's think about the non flicker components first. Can be reduced by increasing what? <coughs> GM. GM of the transistor, right? Which means that the gain of the stage, the transconductance of the, the more transconductance that I get, it says I get lower input preferred noise. How about the output noise? Would that go down with GM or go up with <coughs> GM? Considering that this would be GM if it's a long channel device. What happens to the output? The output door is actually increasing with GM. The noise, so if you actually, well, if you're sitting in the lab and measuring this, you increase your GM, you see more noise at the output. But I claim it's a good thing still. Why? <coughs> so the input referred noise is going down. But the output referred, the actual physical output noise is increasing, but I'm claiming that it's still better to increase GM and get more noise at the output. Why is that? Correct. So because it's really going back to signal. Because when you calculate the input preferred noise, you're really taking the effect of signal into account. What you're saying effectively is that, yes, I get more noise, but my noise goes up only as GM. If I double my GM, my noise power doubles. But my signal power goes up as what? GM squared, so it quadruples. So it's another way of saying I'm improving my signal to noise ratio. So the input referred noise is a measure of signal to noise ratio. Not just signal, not just noise ratio, noise itself. And it's a more important parameter. Because yes, so if I do this, I get twice as much noise power, but four times more signal power. So the output, which is where I care about the signal-to-noise ratio, my signal-to-noise ratio is better by a factor of two. And that's reflected in this GM. It's a factor of two lower, this input preferred noise. While the output noise is a factor of two higher. And again, I'd like to emphasize this, that the input preferred noise cannot be measured directly. It's an inferred parameter. It's not a physical parameter. It's not that if you actually take an amplifier and put a noise meter at its input, it will give you the noise input preferred noise. So people don't think about it this way sometimes. And you know, when I say it this way, it's obvious, right? Because you know, you see the process. Why is he emphasizing it so much? But sometimes people do things that are implicitly equivalent of measuring noise at the input. which are not correct. They don't see it as explicitly that this is really tantamount to doing that. Okay, so but bottom, so that's one part. So increasing GM is good here. It helps with the channel noise. It also helps with the noise of the resistor, right? Why? <coughs> because the noise of the resistor is sitting there. It's there. It's not going up or down. It's at the output. The voltage it induces at the output is like 4 kTr for a given resistor. But as you increase GM, your signal power is increasing. And that's why you have GM squared here. Because it means that you double your GM, your signal power quadruples, your noise power due to the resistor part, the, resist the part due to the resistor is not changing, so the signal to noise ratio, is, oh, if the resistor was, was the only element to take into account, quadruples. So that's why your input preferred noise has an inverse proportionality, inverse square dependence. That. Again, it's a measure of signal to noise ratio. How about flicker noise? Well, flicker noise is what it was, because to begin with, this noise source is as, at the input. So if you want to lower your flicker noise, you have to lower the fundamental noise. There's not much of a gain and circuit.
circuit design trick that you can tricks that you can do. You basically need to adjust the dimensions of the transistor to give you a lower noise. Somehow lower the noise of the transistor. Now this may or may not be important. Again, if you are operating this is an RF amplifier, the flicker noise doesn't matter. Nobody really bothers with RF. Flicker noise in RF amplifiers. But if it's a precision low frequency amplifier, <coughs> maybe the only thing you worry about. You don't care about those terms. Can you give a quick general order of magnitude? Okay, you can do calculus. Actually, we can do some numbers. We can put some numbers here. That's a good question. So let's just put some numbers. Let's first of all the KT, right? What is KT at room temperature? Ballpark. Okay. Ballpark. Yeah. The, the, the approximately the easiest thing that people use is four ten to the minus twenty one joules. It, this is a good number to remember. Because, well, this is bulk. So K is 1.38 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin times 300 Kelvin. It's approximately that. It's a little bit. I mean, it's in that bulk. So 4 times to the minus 21 is a good number for K to remember. At room temperature. Ballpark at room temperature, of course. You can always calculate it accurately. So 4 times that gives you 1.6 10 to the minus 20. Right, that's 4 kT. Noise power. Right? So let's say your resistance is 1 kilo. For 1 kilo ohm resistance, 4 kT R is 1.6 10 to the minus 17. <coughs> okay? Which I can write as 16 10 to the minus 18. Volt squared for hertz. So, what is the RMS voltage due to the thermal noise of a resistor? It's the square root of that, right? Four nanovolts. Per root hertz, right? So, it's basically 4, 10 to the minus 9, 4 nanovolts per root hertz. 4 nanovolts per root hertz. Now, when I write it like this, this is basically tells you how much you get in the spectrum. How much voltage you get? So let's say it depends on what kind of bandwidth your system has. If your bandwidth is, let's say, let's say you have one megahertz of bandwidth. So let's say you're interested in your, your circuit captures only lets the noise pass from zero to one megahertz. So what what do you get? <coughs> Four microvolts, micro right? Because you have root hertz, so you have to take the root root of the bandwidth. If it's one megahertz, the root would be one kilo square root of hertz. So cancel that square root of hertz. So that gives you four microvolts. So it means that for one kilo ohm resistor, if you have one megahertz of bandwidth, you have four microvolts of RMS voltage. What if your bandwidth is one terabits? Four millivolts. Right. 
So that's good. But so this is the way you would go about it. But you have finite bandwidth generally. You have the known bandwidth, and the bandwidth basically tells you how much noise voltage you can expect to see. So we saw that for one megahertz it could be four <coughs> microvolts per root hertz. Four microvolts, RMS. So that's for that. So now if you input refer, so this is for KTR, right? So now you can basically divide it by the gain of the amplifier. So whatever the gain of this amplifier is, but let's say the gain of, if this gain of the amplifier is 10, then the input referred noise gets divided by what? Due to this source. Gets divided by 100. Right? Remember? So this is the output referred noise. Let's say your bandwidth is 1 megahertz. Let's say bandwidth is 1 megahertz. So that gave us the VRMS, the noise RMS voltage, of approximately 4 microvolts, for the, due to the resistor only. Now, the input preferred noise of this would be happily dividing this by the voltage gain. So if you have a gain of 10, then it becomes 400, so VRMS input preferred would be 400 nanovolts. It means that if your only source of noise was this resistor, when your input signal is comparable to your noise, you're, you, you have a 400 nanovolts is the signal where the signal noise ratio is around 1 or 0 dB. So if you had no other sources of noise, that would be, if, and if you didn't do anything special about it, if you're sick, if you didn't have any processing gain or something like that, you basically would have be able to detect things on that order. 400 nanovolts at the input. Now, to give you an idea, do you know what is the sensitivity of your cell phone receiver? Like, what is the smallest signal that you can detect in your, at the input of your cell phone? I mean, there is processing gain there, too, but just... But, no, what is the sensitivity in dBm? Do you know? Minimal power that you can receive a bit. It's about minus 110. So, depending on the, the for CDMA ones, a little bit lower um, because you have processing gain. So, let's say, let's assume it's minus 110 dBm. 1 dBm, or 0 dBm, sorry, 0 dBm is 1 milliwatt. That's what M is for, milliwatt. So what's the power, what's the 110 dBm? 100, minus 30 dBm is 1 microwatt, minus 60 dBm is 1 nanowatt, minus 90 dBm is 1 picowatt, okay? Um, and minus 120 would be 1 attawatt, so this would be 10 attawatts. Ten to the minus, I'm oh, sorry, pentawatts, not pentawatts. Ten to the minus fourteen, right? Ten to the minus fourteen watts at the input. Let's say it's a fifty ohm resistor. What's the voltage? So or RMS voltage. So this it's basically power is the RMS voltage squared divided by the resistance. So this times 50 ohms. So VRMS squared is going to be 50 times that. Let's say 100 for the sake of argument. To make it simple. 10 to the minus 12 <coughs> volts squared. So this is 10 to the minus 6 volts. So the signal that you get at the input is about 1 micro. It's a little bit less than that, actually, because it's a little bit less than that. And I dropped the factor of 2 here, the 50 ohm. But the ballpark, it's less than mic microvolts. If you can detect it. All right, so this gives you a sense of the numbers. Any other questions? into 
one source. But think about it. If I wanted to capture everything for all choices of input drives, is this really a good choice? If my voltage input source is a voltage source, this is okay, right? Because my input, let's say, what I actually drive this circuit with, my signal. So this is the V input referred for the noise. And this is the actual signal. But now what if my signal source was a current source?
things they are not correlated or partially correlated? Partially correlated? Partially meaning that there's part of it that's correlated and part of it that's not correlated. Actually, they are fully correlated in this case. Because one is related to the other proportionately, right? This goes up, this goes up. Right? They are fully correlated. At any given frequency, they are related to a scalar. Their waveforms look the same, more or less, at, for any bandwidth of any. So they're correlated sources. So you have to be careful when you deal with these two sources now. If you want to take the effect of some arbitrary signal in, 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 in the input into account, you have to really add the amplitude of the signal due to this and the amplitude of the signal due to that to get the total out. Not the power. So this is an example of how the sources become correlated. Now, why are they correlated? Because they are both due to the same physical sources. They are due to these three physical forces, the filter noise, the channel thermal noise, and the, noise of the, the thermal noise of the resistor. They are due to the same thing, and in this case they are related to some sort of a constant. Yes? Um, it, I'm sure we're not, but how do we, how do we make sure we're not double counting? Well, we are. We are double counting, and that's why they have to take into account as correlated. Well, that's why you say the minus the, the no, no, no. But see, we are not double counting because at any given impedance, see, think about it this way. If, my, if I'm driving the source to input with an ideal voltage source, let's say my VIN is an ideal voltage source, so my source impedance is zero. Which one has a more larger impact? What is the impact of the current source? No. None. Because it's a current source in parallel with the voltage source, right? Then you know this source. Look at this carefully. This voltage source is in parallel with this current source. So the current source doesn't matter. So you're only effectively getting the effect of one. You're not double counting. Now, if I were to drive this with a current source, <coughs> when I know this, I open it. Now, what is the in which one has a larger impact? The current source, the voltage source has no impact whatsoever because one end of it is floating in the air. You can actually show that if you put some arbitrary impedance here, Z, you get the same total noise at the output, which is the measure of things. So this is the, the thing to remember. The, the, the test, the actual measure of things, is what's the total noise at the output, because that's a physical parameter. If it gives you something that's not physical, then you've done something wrong. And that's the way you usually calculate things. If the, the procedure, the classical procedure, is to determine the total output noise and then reflect it back to the input. And the way to calculate these two is that you reflect it back to the input with the zero source impedance, it gives you the voltage. You reflect it back to the input with an infinite source impedance, it gives you the current. I'll show you more examples as we go forward. That's the procedure. So with that procedure, as long as you do it the right way, you can see, and that goes back to the theorem. I haven't proved it to you, but it can be proven. I can give you references. It's a very classical old theorem. The two-port model, the model for two-port right. noise system. Okay. Any other questions?
calculating the output noise and getting back the input. It's kind of like similar to a small signal model, right? Whenever in doubt, you can draw the small signal model and determine what the general thing is. But after a while, you say, okay, well, I know how the small signal thing, thing behaves in this case, so I don't need to read it. So let's think about this case where you have basically a V bias, you have an active load, you have an N mass and a P mass, this is V in and V out. And I want to calculate the input preferred noise. Let's say the input preferred voltage noise. We know how to convert it to current. So what noise sources do we take into account? Let's say you have the two channel noises. Let's call this I <coughs> squared over delta F. It's 4 K T gamma G. Let, let's say they are long channel devices. Let's make it simple. G M N. And, and then this is I P squared over delta F, which is 4 K T gamma. This could be a different gamma. But if they're long channel, they're the same. 4K, T, gamma, GP. And let's take into account the flicker noise of the two, the noise sources of the transistor. So I have one here. So I have V, F, N, square over delta F. I know it's KF over C, W, whatever, etc., etc. C times W times L, 1 over F. And another one here. V, F, P, square over delta F. Okay, so now from a small signal perspective, oh, this is brown. It's the bias voltage, it's brown. So, if I were to calculate the output, total output noise of the output, first of all, I need to know what's the out impedance on the output. What is the output impedance? Of that number? Borrow parallel or P. That's the total impedance on that, from that load to ground, to the AC ground. Okay? So, what are the effects of each one of these noise sources? Let's calculate. So let's start with the flicker. This one. So Vfn squared over delta F goes through the voltage gain from here to there, which is the voltage gain of the stage from its input to the output. What is the voltage gain? Gmn RON parallel ROP. So and Gmn. R-O-N parallel R-O-P squared squared plus this guy. Well, you have to see what's the voltage gain from this node to here. What, how's it different? GMP. It's GMP, right? <laughs> because now this is like a common source from, from the perspective of this guy. You see? This is the input, this is the output from the perspective of this guy. And this is not, so this is ground. So you see, it would become VFP squared over delta F, GMP squared RON parallel ROP squared plus. Now the channel load sources. This guy. This is the current source being injected to the node with some impedance. So it would be that current source that times the impedance. So it's I, you can call it I M squared over delta F times R O N parallel R O P squared plus and similarly for that guy I P squared over delta F R O N parallel R O P squared. So that's the total output noise. So this is V out over delta F. Now I want to do the input preferred noise. I divide it by the gain from the signal input to the output. The signal input to the output as a gain of GMN RON parallel ROP. I have to divide it by that. So V in squared over delta F is 1 over GMN squared RON parallel ROP squared times V out squared over delta F. So which basically completely cancels this guy out. So you get the VFN flicker noise of this guy, which is not surprising. This was already at the input. So when you input refer, what we did, we took it from the input, took it to the output, brought it back to the input. So it was quite a bit redundant, but just did it. So and VFP squared over delta F, now this one has a GMP and divided by GMN, so it becomes GMP over GMN squared squared. Plus, this guy divided by what is Gmn squared, so we have 1 over Gmn squared, I n squared over delta F, plus Ip squared over delta F. 
So you can see that the channel noises are scaled by 1 over gm, which is basically the conversion factor from this voltage to that current, magnitude squared. And if they have some gm dependence, then you will see what they behave. You can actually ex express it explicitly. You see the clicker noise of this guy is there, verbatim. The clicker noise of this guy is reflected to this input with the ratio of gmp to gmn, which is the ratio of the gain of this whole, this path to this path, right? And the current of the output is reflected to an input voltage source with a ratio of, with a gain of gm, which is the conversion factor from this voltage to this current. So I could probably tell by looking at it from the beginning what the input repertoire is was without writing all of this mess. I mean, how do we do that? Say, so, well, I want to determine what's the voltage of the input that would give me the total effect of all of these, right? So how do we do that? Well, this guy is already there. Let me write it. This guy is going through a gain and a reverse gain, right? The gain is a GMP time RO, and then the reverse gain is GMN times RO. So I have a GMP over GMN, but squared because it's a voltage squared. So that's like the factor that's scaled by. This is the current at the output. I want to convert it to a voltage at the input. And the conversion is done to a GM. So it has to be divided by GM squared. So these two are divided by GM N squared. Again, if, it's, if you're in doubt, you can always go through the procedure. <coughs> but after a while, you get used to say, okay, so this is reflected at the input. You're reflecting them back everything. You're bringing everything here. Okay, let me show you another example. Let's look at a common gate. So this is going to be bias. And let's consider only the channel noise, in this case to make life easy, and the resistance. So this is I channel squared over delta F, which is 4KT. Yeah, well, let's say it's a long channel device, make our lives easier. GM. So it's a, I'm assuming it's a long channel. Non velocity saturated. And let's say you have a current source here, and this would be I R squared over delta F, which is 4KT over R. So let's say these are two more sources. So I want to tell you the <coughs> first voltage noise. So that means that I'm driving the input with a voltage source. So I have to null the input. So this is a Vn. So if I null this input, what is my input? So what happens? What, is it? what are the sources? What is the equivalent? What? So let's think about this thing. What are the equivalent? <coughs> what is the equivalent input preferred noise that I would need to give me the effect of these two at the output? Well, if I'm in doubt, I can just calculate what the effect of those two is at the output without the source, and then see what would give me that. So these two are both injecting current into the output, and you have to like, take it, the output impedance into account. Now, the way I've drawn it, it's basically the same as that common gate, common source that I have first, right? So the output noise would be this guy. Times the output resistance, which is R D squared, plus I R squared over delta F times R D squared. And the voltage gain from here, from this source, <coughs> to the output is what is the gain? What is the voltage gain from here to the common gain? GMRD. So I have to divide everything to reflect it to the input, to this input voltage source by GMRD. So V in squared over delta F is this divided by GMRD, so it's basically squared, so it's GM squared <coughs> channel squared over delta F plus 1 over GM squared I R squared over delta F, which basically is this one is 4 K T gamma gm over gm squared plus 
kt over gm squared rd. That's the input referred voltage source, very similar to the common gate because when you remove the source, when you know the voltage input voltage source, it is a common, it's the same as the common gate. I'm sorry, common source. The common source. Now, how about the input preferred current source? If I want to evaluate the effect of the input preferred current source, I have to see what the current source and the input. So I have to drive the input to the current source and determine what it is. So if the input is driven by a current source, what is the output noise voltage first? Well, you have to be careful. So I have to know this. But when I know that I've opened this, <coughs> right? So what is the in, what is the noise at the output? What is the voltage noise at the output? No, it's not zero. Uh, resistive noise. The resistive noise, right? Because think about it. This guy has what and open. So this current is bound to be the same. So this current and that current have to be the same because this current is zero. Which means that this current, since it's the same as that, there's no gate current. Where basically this current is zero. This current can only <coughs> circulate inside the device. So one end of it is floating. Right? This current and that current are equal. These are all equal, so they're forming a loop internally rotating. Now, what does that leave at the output? The noise of the resistor. So it's the voltage noise of the resistor. You can say basically it's a 4KTR. So in that case, so this is a different situation. V out squared over delta x, a different V out, is going to be simply the noise of the resistor, the second term, which would be 4KTRD. Because it's, this is 4KTRD over, 4KT over RD times RD squared <coughs> 4KTR. Okay? So what is the input preferred, what is the current at the input? The noise current at the input that would cause that voltage at the output. Well, what's the current gain from here to there? One. And that current converts the voltage through this RD. So the current to this voltage, from the gain from this current to that voltage is RD. So I have to divide this by RD squared, right? So the input preferred current source due to this is going to be 1 over RD squared <coughs> times V out squared over delta F, which is basically 4 KTRD. But it should not be that surprising because that's the current noise of the load. And this is one of the disadvantages of our common gate stage from a noise perspective. It reflects the output noise, the noise of whatever is at the drain. Directly, the current noise is reflected directly to the input. There's no attenuation, there's no gain. Because the current gain from here to there is 1. So, whatever the current noise you have here, you will see it, it will get reflected exactly the same way to the input. So, it has, it can generate common gate stages, can have large current noise. So, but the most interesting thing is now, I have to ask you a question. So this is the key question. So I said I have to, to model this, I have a voltage source and a current source, right? So the equivalent thing at the input of this thing looks like this. I have this current source, I in squared over delta F, which we calculated here. And then we have this voltage source, V in squared over delta F, which we calculated here. This and that. So these are the things that are presented at the input of this thing. Think about it as equivalent input model. This is whatever your input is connected to. What can you say about the correlation of these two forces? They're partially correlated, right? Which parts are correlated? The parts that are caused by the same physical mechanism. This is caused by the resistor. So is this one. So this much of it is fully correlated, but this much is not. So this is the correlated part, and this is the uncorrelated part.
Uh, there are a couple more things that I wanted to cover, small things, but um, I think we should do it next time because we're running out of time now. But any questions on this? So far. So let me summarize for you what we did. We said any circuit, I mean, in any general circuit, there are lots of noise sources, current sources, voltage noise sources, right? Due to different physical mechanisms. Each one of the transistors can have multiple ones. If there are multiple transistors, there are multiple, multiple, multiple sources, and so on and so forth. The effect of all of these, each one of them will have an effect of the output. Whatever node you associate with the output, which is basically, you can say, assign this node as the output. And each one of them will have an effect. How do you calculate the effect? You use superposition. Because, and the reason you can use superposition is that these are small signals. Noise is a very small signal. So your small signal models, which are linear models, are accurate. <coughs> you can use the linearity, which leads linearity necessitates superposition. So you can individually assess their effects. You have to take their correlation into account, but if they are caused by different physical sources, they're uncorrelated, so the other powers add. And that gives you a total output noise power. Now, wherever your input is, you can determine the transfer function from this input to that output and say, what is the source at the input that I need to have to generate that signal at the output? And to determine that, that output noise that you've calculated, you divide it by the magnitude squared of that transfer function. That gives you the input referred to. Now, you have to do this twice to capture the effect of all different changes that you can have at the input source. You can do it once with the input shorted. That gives you the input preferred voltage source. You can do it one more time with the input open. That would give you the effect of the input preferred current noise. These two calculations determine the input preferred voltage source and input the input preferred current source, current current source, and those are sufficient. Those are necessary and sufficient to, be, to characterize the entire noise in the system. And what you do, you compare these with your signal that you have at the input, and that's why the input preferred noise is a good thing because it really captures both the gain of the signal and the noise amplification in the system. So it allows you to directly compare your input signal with your input preferred noise and see how much signal to noise you have. Because that's the signal to noise ratio that you will have at the output. When the signal goes through the system and all the noise is added,